and welcome to Personal Branding in Our AI World. I'm thrilled to have you here today. This is the first time I've ever done this presentation. It is resource rich, literally 25 interconnected resources. You're going to have full access to all of it, so don't worry. And I'm going to make sure that even though this is such a layered and detailed process to cultivate your personal brand, you will have very specific actionable takeaways and we will have time for engagement and questions. You'll be able to actually implement some of these strategies moving forward after today. Welcome to personal branding in our AI world. You will get access to this deck and when you click on this link, it takes you to a summary of every single resource that is linked throughout. We're here today for your online persona, and it's how you establish yourself as the best choice for your dream client without pretending you're anything you're not. It's similar to creating an alter ego, but it's not like an alter ego, like you're Beyonce and you have Sasha Fierce, and it's this completely heightened version of you that's a little bit over the top and not really relatable, but it is highlighting the aspects of your personality you like the most and toning down your insecurities. So your online persona is kind of like you with a really great outfit on. It's dressed to express and it's how you show up online. So the beauty about having an online persona is that it's like having a magical shadow that just works for you 24 seven. So you can be chilling at home with your family, having a coffee, going for a walk, sleeping, but that online persona is there existing and being accessible and available to your potential clients. We're in a world of AI influencers. No longer are you just being an dated with everyone being a human influencer on social media there's actually now robots and bots and not even not even real people who are amassing huge followings but if you look online the people with the most followers are still sports star stars Ronaldo and Messi Selena Gomez who's a singer and the most popular AI influencer is Lou She's got 6.5 million followers, and we're starting to see the likes of AI-generated girlfriends. Judy Karen doesn't have that many followers on Instagram, but almost a million subscribers on YouTube. So she's an influencer turned AI personality. So if you've seen what Meta's doing at the moment with the likes of Kylie Jenner and Mr. Beast, but then they're making AI clones of celebrities but giving them other names. So I think Mr. Beast is called Billy and he's like your AI friend, except it looks like Mr. Beast, but it talks like a generic Billy. Karen is actually a real person and you can date her and interact with the AI version of her, but real Karen actually exists in real life with her boyfriend. So this is what's going on in the landscape at the moment. And this is why <laughs> Sophie looks shocked. This is why it's more important than ever to establish your personal brand as something that is human and relatable to your people, because maybe you don't want millions of boyfriends online. Maybe you don't have an album to sell. In fact, maybe you're not a public figure or a celebrity, but you're something else. And if you are a person on a mission with a message, then you too need a personal brand, but you do not need to do it like you are a public figure or a celebrity. Your online persona is so that you make maximized impact to your people. So today we're really thinking about who your people are because that's who you want to gravitationally pull towards you, not the masses. You're not here to be an influencer. That's not what this talk is about. This is just an online persona so that you can be highly visible without being chronically online 24 seven so that you can come across as credible without showing off and bragging every two seconds, and so that you can be human without being overly personal. You do not have to share every single insecurity, vulnerability, bad thing that ever happened to you, every single moment of your life. In fact, you can share very strategically and still be accessible and connect to people without bearing your soul to the whole world. We're not in the stage anymore of people going on Facebook and writing cryptic messages. If you remember back in the day in 2012, where it's like, their time will come, karma will get you. I remember, like, if you remember when social media was just starting out, people were really using social media as diary entries. That's not what it's for. Express yourself, but it can be done in a way that actually works for you. And then you're going to do that through magnetic attraction through your heart. And I've used this disco heart because that's what we are as true creators. We are kaleidoscopic, we're multifaceted, we're multidimensional. We are fractured edges like a diamond. That's what makes us shine. So this idea that you have to be consistent and just one thing is a total lie. 
Just remember that no one calls Richard Branson multi-passionate. They call him a mogul. You are not multi-passionate because you have lots of different parts of your personality. You're a human. You're creative. You get to share any aspect of yourself. And the more you create, the more prolific you are, not the more scattered. So just putting it out there from the beginning, if you're like, I've got so many parts to my personality, what's appropriate? What should I share? What shouldn't I share? We're going to get to that. And there's a very, very simple way to answer those questions. Resource one is the four must-have elements to establish a power brand online. These are the tools, the building blocks you need. You're going to need a brand Bible, a style guide, a social media strategy, and a content calendar. So these are the mechanics of building a brand. Resource two is activating your creative genius. Now we're gonna dive into this a little bit today. This is from Create Business Academy, and this is how you extract some of those sparkly parts of yourself from inside your heart so that you can rediscover trust in your creative self. And I'm gonna give you a quick overview of how this works, and then we're actually gonna do one of these exercises today. Inside, you activate your creative genius. You learn how to stand out online as yourself, and you're also able to custom make your own brand Bible, style guide, social media strategy, and content calendar. This is the DIY version of it. And if you want to know more about standing out online, here's resource three that gives you a breakdown of exactly how to do that based on following what attracts you and what magnetizes you and how you can translate that into things that you share. I'm touching on these. Don't worry. We're going to go deeper into certain sections right now. So here we go. Inside Create Business Academy, there is Activate Your Creative Genius. One of these sections is the playbook. Inside the playbook, which has all these parts and all these pages, there is this question. And this is the question you're going to answer right now. It's very simple. Off the top of your head, can you write down in the chat three things you like and three things you dislike? Very simply, do not overthink this. It's not that deep. Don't overthink. Like, I like uh, leopard print. I like my ring light. I like candles. So Ashley likes glitter, music, and love. Gabe likes technology, family, and music. Haley likes Lauren, my people, and books. Haley wins. Haley wins. That's the answer. Okay. <laughs> Kurt likes dinosaurs. Amazing. Two more, but yes. Coffee, beach, sunset, Victoria. Perfect. Jody, surf culture, my people, nature. Yes, loving your people. Beautiful. Keep these coming. Hey, Nicole. I like Nicole's red hair. Stephen likes TV, books, technology. Dislikes tea, cold, reality TV. What? Reality TV. Stephen, I'm shocked. I love reality TV. Nicole likes cats, true crime, oatmeal coffee. Yes, dislikes real crime, mean dogs, snakes. Great. Let these ideas spark more ideas for you. And I'm going to go back to the presentation. That was beautiful at the top of your head. We're going to take it one level deeper. Now, what do you love? What resonates for you? And these can be simple pleasures in life, like warm socks out the dryer or life-changing situations, like spontaneous immigration. And what do you loathe? Things that irritate you, people who chew loudly, to things that repulse you, like, I'm thinking of like hairy backs. That's quite mean, but like, you know, when you go swimming and someone's got a really hairy back, that kind of repulses me. What do you love? What do you loathe? Aim for three, but even if you do one, that would be great. And again, top of your heart. Reading, music, ocean waves. Kurt, connecting with people, loathe poses. Yes, great. You want to feel what lights you up and what makes you shrink and shrivel. Both are going to be really useful. Gabe loves rum, beach, a good pillow. Loathe closed-minded people, gossip and greed. Great. Yes, we're getting there. Cole loves my mom, lovers, design, loathes war, liars, racists. Great. On and on. These are all wonderful. Oh, small dogs. I thought you said small feet, Stephen. I mixed those up. I was like, what? <laughs> Great. Ashley says, I'm struggling because I think I automatically went to love loathe. So I had to reevaluate. If your like is bigger, just think even bigger than that. You can always expand it and go even bigger. So no problems with that. Why does this matter? Why do we need to know what we love and we loathe? The easiest way to start drawing people to you and repelling ones that are not for you is quite simply to share what you love online and to talk about what you loathe. But really, leading from a place of love is the easiest way to do that. And we're going to unpack the mechanics of that. So when it comes to personal branding, there are four ways to translate your personal brand. There is imagery, there is audio, written, and there is video. 
We're going to be looking specifically at imagery, but I will touch on the other ones. So when it comes to what you love, choose an everyday prop. This is the simplest place to start. So here's an example of Miss Malva when I invented her in 2012, well, her, her incarnation then. And she loved leopard print and drinking wine through a straw and throwing parties. When I launched Malva Media, Miss Malva got really respectable and loved having coffee and bunnies and protea flowers and always had her glasses. When I started to create a version of myself called Create Business Academy, this online persona of me loved wearing robes, drinking coffee and wearing sunglasses. So whether it's digital design or something you're wearing or props that you have around you, choosing something that you can do makes it very easy to start curating your visual images. So right now, I'd like you to think of one prop that you could use in every single picture. The reason this is useful is it's quite awkward to just have your photo taken if you're not doing anything, unless you're a model and you're modeling fashion, like what are you doing in the photo? But if you have a prop, it gives you some action, some activity. So if it's a pencil, like you're writing, or it's sunglasses on your head, or it's coffee that you're drinking, which is why I do all my pictures of coffee, it gives you a repeatable thing to do. It also starts building up that consistency with people who are seeing you and commonality. Because if you choose an everyday prop, the person looking at you also has that thing, does that thing and thinks, oh, I'm like Victoria. I also write in my journal. And so suddenly they've built up reciprocity with you, but it's really not that exposing. You're really not sharing something too intimate, but you are sharing something human and relatable. So pop in the comments, what is a simple prop that you could use? And we're going to look at ways to heighten it and play with that. Haley, my wand. Yes, exactly. So everything should be with your wand. Laptop, keyboard, software engineer. Yes, keyboards all the time. And even that tapping sound or even having individual, um, the, the keyboard like pieces and things that you tap. Roses and other flowers. Yes, you could always have a rose on the table, a rose behind you, a rose on something you're wearing. Stuffed animals. Love it and choose one specifically, like maybe it's a stuffed tiger or a bunny, but there is something in the picture. Feather earrings. Okay, you're getting the point. Glitter. Yes, you could have glitter like as a sparkly background if you're doing it digitally, or you could have glitter on your clothes somehow. AI, yeah, you can also just put things all around you. What you want to start looking at is how can you take this thing and take elements from that into your digital designs. So say it's a pencil, maybe you take that triangular point and that starts to become a design that you have behind you. Maybe it's the colors of a pencil or stripes. Say it's glitter, is that the texture of your backgrounds? Is it the notebook that you always have? Is it on your nails? Your nail polish is always glitter. So it's it's putting it in certain um, elements that are small, and then it's also expanding that to areas around you. Gabe, my phone, even if I'm not on it, I'm cons constantly fidgeting with it. Then Gabe, you're going to need another phone to film you. So I have a phone prop because I'm always filming myself on my phone or taking pictures with my phone. So get a phone that's a prop. And a great one, if you're going to heighten that reality, is you can get like an old fashioned phone and actually use that. Like you're always on a real phone, which of course you're not, but Gabe's always on the phone or you have three phones. Um, I use that a bit for this um, Malva PR, actually. I was always on the phone, but I wasn't, but it's just funny. Haley, genius. Haley, just loving the compliments. All right, let's get going. But you're starting to get the idea. So jot down notes as we're speaking of ways you can spark this on. And I'm going to show you a specific example of how you really start translating idea sparks into content styling. So if you look at a brand styling map, which is what we're doing today, it is layered, multifaceted, and everything's interconnected. So of course you have your brand identity, but then you've also got mood boards and you take the brand identity and your mood boards into your content styling, which translates to your personal branding, your staged offices, like how we are now in our little Zoom box, and styling your social media platforms. And all of these have subcategories and sub pieces. Just let this wash over you, but we are actually going through some of these today. When it comes to translation, think about what visually attracts you. Now, this isn't what you love, but it probably you love it or like it a little bit. But in life, online, in nature, in art, fashion or decor, what is an element that really is aesthetically pleasing to you? So I love neutral tones when it comes to decor, 
I love leopard print and velvet. I love trees and overcast skies. I love absurdist art. Check what you're putting here. A 70s vibe, great. Lots of color, holographic, everything, amazing. And Jody, with the 70s vibe, like, is that the music? Is it like, I think of roller skates on a checkered, like, floorboard? Sophie, turquoise, is that the stone or is that the color? What parts of turquoise? So get super specific because what you'll realize is you can say a word and that word has 10,000 connotations to it. But if you say turquoise to all of us in this room, all of us will pull up a different image. So I think of a turquoise crystal or like a ring or the jewelry that I like with turquoise, but you might be thinking of the color of a certain clothes or the ocean or so get as detailed as possible about what is it about that visual thing that actually attracts you because it's different for everyone. And that's why everyone's personal brand, if it's laid in detailed, looks very different. This is also important, not just in briefing a designer, but in briefing AI who's going to create content for you because you want to prompt it specifically. So you need to get really granular about what parts of these things do you like. So even like that glowiness. Now, with these examples, what you're going to want to do after the session, once you've got all your notes, is you're going to want to start to pull together a visual collection of exactly what this looks like and sometimes what it feels like. And here is an example that I love that I did with a client. We'll go through it slowly so it's not as complicated as it seems. This is from an, the ideas expansion. So as part of Activate Your Creative Genius, once you've done all the activation and answered all the questions, we answered one of the hundreds of questions that are there. We took one of the ideas, which was from a brand life exercise, which is if you were a food, what food would you be? And this brand said there would be um, a salmon steak, but actually they would taste like Spanish mackerel sushi. We got this picture of this uh, Spanish mackerel sushi and the designer then looked at that and said, hmm, the sparkling iridescent lights on this and the colors kind of look like glowy background lights. And they put together kind of the, the feel and the expansion of sushi. Then they thought about the shape of salmon when you slice it and how that maybe looked like a digital fingerprint, a golden digital fingerprint. And now one of the elements used in this brand from sushi would be this golden touch point this point of connection, this beautiful, unique fingerprint. Now that's stunning. That alone is a whole brand. And it came from one idea spark, which is if I was food, what would I be? What would I taste like? And suddenly you've got background and colors and digital, and it just takes you on a journey. So you start simple. And the more you just rediscover trust in your creative self, the more you start going, where could I take this? What else could this be? And you allow yourself to be taken on a journey until your brand has a depth and a resonance to it that isn't as literal as pictures of sushi on everything you post, but there's a subtle background of potentially a golden touch point. Better check for questions. Kurt, love that. I love that you love that. Great. So here's where we're taking the brand identity and the questions from activating your creative genius, and we're putting this into a style guide. This style guide becomes the basis of all your digital design templates because you want to have a running list of templates so content creation becomes easy and it's translated in how you create content, how you curate it, what you get from online, how you collaborate with others, the way you brief them on the way you want content to be done and how you coordinate your existing content. Say for that, you decide, I actually love that single fingerprint and a super just, just the one element Maybe you decide, I'm going to take pictures that I have and I'm going to strip out the background and just make everything very white and just have a small element. Or I'm going to blow it up really big and give it a close up. Or I'm going to cut off half the picture. But you have an understanding of how you work with your existing images and you get to repurpose them. Also, how you start to look for props that you're going to use in your showcase space, which we're going to get to in a minute. So we're talking about content styling. No longer is it a brand that is static and living online that is just flat, but it integrates into every single touch point you have with every piece of content across every single social media platform. And here's one of my favorites of all time. I added this in at last minute today. So you've gone up from 22 resources to 25. This is so rich that you could just actually look at this resource because it's got so many in them. But we're going to just pause here for a moment. And I won't give you all the lessons. There are seven lessons from Jane and her little black dress. But I'm just going to tell you a story real quick. I want you to imagine that you're at a cocktail party. 
and you meet this delightful woman named Jane and she's in a gorgeous little black dress and you get to chatting and she's super insightful. She's highly intelligent. She's just a delight. You realize you have things in common and you start to think, I think I could actually really be friends with this person. She really gets me. That Jane is just gorgeous inside and out. The next day, you're going to gym and you notice that across the room, there's Jane. And you notice because she's wearing the same little black dress, except it's now seven in the morning. And it's like, hey, Jane. And she's like, oh, hey, how's it going? And she's super lovely. And so you don't really want to say like, what's up? Like, did you not go home? Did you not change? She's acting like nothing's wrong. She's just there in her black dress. After work that day, you go to the movies and there's Jane in line for popcorn. And she's got the same dress on. And you're like, something's actually weird. Like, she's nice, but I mean, does she not change? Does she not shower? Like, this is just getting odd. You're like, okay, Jane, hi. And now you're starting to feel a little uncomfortable because it's just not normal to wear the same clothes every single day. We show up differently depending on the environment that we're in and the situation and the time of day. We change our clothes. Now we're going to reimagine the story in a different way. First part, you know, you meet her at a cocktail party. Exactly the same. She's a lot. Next time you go to gym and you see Jane again and she's dressed in Lululemon and she's lifting weights and you're like, oh, Jane. And she looks at you, completely ignores you and just carries on with what she's doing. It's very disconcerting, very strange. It's like, did we not have a connection? Like, didn't we get on? Like, why is she changing the way she's acting to me? It's very upsetting. Later that, that, that day, you go to the movies, you see her again and you're like, hey, Jane, a little bit nervous. And she's like, oh my God. And she wraps her arms around you and swings you around the movie cinema. And she's like, it's so good to see you. And it's like, is she bipolar? Is she having a manic episode? Like, what is wrong with Jane? Both ways are very confusing. Too nice, too cold, hot and cold, but she's dressed appropriately. This is what brands are doing incorrectly all the time. You cannot show up dressed same on every single social media platform you can't just slap your logo on the same piece of content and post it on instagram on tiktok on linkedin on a billboard and it's the same the same the same the same because every platform is a different environment but you also can't have a really cool brand that speaks to you beautifully on tiktok and engages and gives you the cold shoulder on linkedin when you talk because you've got two different people running the accounts and it's a totally different experience so you really need to make sure that there is a golden thread of personality that runs throughout your brand that is always connected, that is always engaged, that is always lovely. And there's a level of consistency with the relatability of how it engages, but it can look entirely different. And the beauty of this is if you have multiple projects or multiple businesses, like I do, you might want to have multiple brands. I've got a bunch of versions of me online that all look different, but it's always me. There's always a vibe. It's always going to be a similar kind of thing. So that's what I want you to keep in mind with your brand. When you're building this, there's a common thread, the things you love, the things you, the things you don't stand for, but the way you look, you can experiment and play and let this give you room for creativity where you can really expand and change your colors and change your content styles. But the essence of who you are remains the same. How do you balance the different personas of different brands? So that's going to come into tone and vibe, which we're going to touch on in, in a minute. Um, and this is part of your brand Bible of really knowing what each brand stands for and what they don't stand for. So having that deeper understanding of the personality and then that gets translated into the visuals and you have more flexibility with the visuals, less flexibility on like what the brand stands for. And each brand may even have core beliefs, but they look so different that it comes out differently. A lot of you have already said, people and finding your people and community is important to you, but how you showcase that and how you play with that would be different depending on the way you like to engage and the way you like to play. So here's a basic resource on basic brand identity styling. Looking at what colors are you using, what fonts, what's your header text. Remember now sticking to visuals, um, a visual imagery specifically. So this gives you a breakdown of exactly how to do that. And it also links to digital design templates and most specifically, Rowflow. I'm obsessed with Rowflow. And that is how do you flow your row on social media? Whether this is your Instagram or your LinkedIn account, if someone's scrolling through, 
is there a style? Is there like a way in which you are curating your feed? All the information for this is inside Content Stylist. It gives you everything you need and you can tap through to see exactly what goes into that here. But let's take a look at Content Stylist into the Rowflow Guidebook, which helps you with styling your specific platforms. This is a 57 page guidebook and I'm gonna show you some of my favorite designs to spark some ideas for you. And you can choose any of these you like. So here is the checkered example that you just saw. And this is used for the new Mulva PR page. It's also used for AI Impact. We're doing a checkered flow. And we're actually doing shapes within the flow. Here's a diagonal pattern posting for human doing, the first book that I wrote. And here was a really uh, like extensive one that, that I did for a dating app called Wango Dating App, which was a diagonal floating heart in between things. When you get into creative pattern play with your platforms, it helps you to plan your content, not just on what are the days of the week, but in what is the vibe and the flow of this whole platform. And if you're a creative thinker, it's just a way more fun way to plan your content than to stick with like a schedule of what are my content pillars? I've got to hit these certain calls to action. You can actually start being more creative with it. Resource eight is from branding to bonding. It gives you more detail on things we've discussed, which is the power of translating your brand into content styling. So your brand is going to have multiple touch points. For example, if you have a blog, you're going to need blog headers for each picture. So does this have a common theme and style? Do you want to put together a mood board of what are the elements for your staged office? We put this together and then translated these into the actual office space. So this breakdown gives you all of that, but you get a quick overview. And then combining these is getting you visible online, the impact of your personal branding and staged offices for themed photo shoots. Now, what you saw just back here of these elements they're used very clearly here in the stage office setup that was created for Malva PR. This actual Malva personality is a combination of the original Miss Malva, Betty Boop, Priscilla Presley, Kim Kardashian, Samantha Jones, the character, and Chris Jenner, like the mother of, you know, PR vibe. And that's the vibe that I wanted to create a very millennial, nostalgic, over the top brand for Malva PR. You're also gonna start creating content styling elements, mood boards, and references guides that pull through from real life onto your platform, like onto your website. So, what are the elements that you can use for props? highly recommend a sweet treat like if you can incorporate like a donut or a cupcake or something tasty because then you always have to have a treat because it's just good for business to just take a take a little pick with that or you always got to have fresh flowers or always got to have good candles so choose stuff you love because it actually is good for business and it's good for your content. Here's the resource nine again, um, which explains exactly how to do this and create your stage office for your themed photo shoots. Now, even if you decide to create a virtual background, you would still use this in digitally creating a virtual background for yourself. So it doesn't have to be in real life. You can make it up too. There's different options within personal branding. I'm giving you an overview of things you can do yourself. So takeaways from today, resources you can go to, go and study yourself, courses you can do, or you can actually hire Malva Media, which is the mothership agency. It's the big sister to Malva PR, and it does all the stuff for you. It actually creates all these different elements. Or just ask your designer or your team to make these things for you based on what you've seen today. Now we're speaking a little bit about what we touched on earlier, expanding to your edges, like your, your starness means that you got to expand and sometimes it's uncomfortable for you and for others you get to be quite contrary. So taking those loves and loathes and now translating them verbally into your vibe. What are your convictions and controversial hot takes? What's your perspective and your personal viewpoint? What are your contradictions and paradoxes? And what is your general philosophy of life? When you think toward the future and what you want it to be like, what is that? So the more you have a thesis for the future, the easier it is to talk about the present because you've got context of, I came from this, I see these shifts, this is where we're going. A personal brand has a vision for the future. You're saying, let's go in this direction and people who are aligned with that vision will follow in, in, that, in those footsteps. Victoria calls it aligned ignition, which I love. And it just, things take off into that slipstream when you have the same vision for the future. 
So if you love this and that person loves this, there's no convincing needed. You both love it. When I post about coffee and mochas, everyone who loves a coffee is like, yeah, me too. I think about you when I have that coffee. It's a, it's a very easy commonality. So you can do the same thing. There's not just how you say things and how you talk about them. You might decide that actually you don't want to write. You don't want to do images. You just want to talk to the camera or you just want to record your voice and you want to do voice notes or a podcast. This content quiz is a great resource and it'll tell you what your zone of genius is in content and give you a breakdown of exactly what you can make next based on your zone of genius. And we're going to stop the share here for a minute because what I would love to know is what is one of the biggest contradictions or personal paradoxes that you hold in your mind or you hold about yourself? For example, I'll give you one of mine. I am an extremely freedom loving person. Like I want to live a totally free life. And yet I do not like to cross the road unless it's a green light. I love to play by the rules and I love, I take direction very well. So it's like, it's just a weird contradiction. It's like I'll immigrate in a, with, on, on a dam, but I will not, I don't, I, I think jaywalking is a bit extreme. I think maybe we should stick to the rules. So when you think of yourself, what is something that you could share that is like, I'm this, but I'm this. Another one I can tell you is, and you might just know this from just watching humans. I've noticed that the angriest people in life are often the kindest. They're so angry and they just want to connect and they don't know how. And it's like, I love angry people because I know they've got like hearts of gold and because I'm an angry person. So like, I don't judge it. See this, I'm a cashew. My mom is Jewish and my dad is Catholic. Yeah. Amazing. So that's just a great juxtaposition. These are our edges that actually make people hook and connect with us. A great commonality, which will sound like um, I'm speaking about a contradiction here, but I'm not. A lot of creatives feel like we are terminally unique. No one is like us. They don't have our identity. They don't have our background. No one would understand the challenges we faced. And yet you start sharing those things about yourself, really specific how you do, how you maybe have questioned your identity or where you belong or who are you really. And most people can actually relate to those things. I'm thick skinned, can handle crisis comms, but at times I get too personally invested in other people's feelings. Yes, hugely relatable. I think about everything too much, but tend to be rash when it comes to making the actual decisions, if that makes sense, 100%. I get thinking overwhelmed and then I'm just like, okay, yeah, I'll do that thing. And it's like, wait, what? Totally, yeah. I'm deeply compassionate and also have the biggest heart for those affected with mental illness, addiction, trauma, and will also scream from the rooftops that we are responsible to address these things ourselves. <laughs> yes. I mean, I really agree with that one. Yeah. I'm like, we've got to do this ourselves, but I'm sure that if I date you, I could just change you or love you into wholesomeness. Like, I'm sure that actually. So these are the kind of things that we're all more the same than we are different. And one thing I want to say as something I deeply believe is that even that idea or any binary, masculine, feminine, um, different races, ages, parts of the world, there are so many things to separate us. But at our core, we all have the same emotions and we've all felt most of them by the time we're 18. So whether my shame is different to your shame, if you know shame and you know depression and you know longing and you know desire and you know a broken heart and you know desperate hopefulness, those are the things that make us human. And the more we can speak about that, the more easier it is to get along because we are more similar than we are different. And it stops becoming so awkward to put yourself out there because you're not putting yourself out there to all these strangers who are going to judge you. It's just mirror reflections of you. So the more comfy you get with it, the more other people are like, oh yeah, like, yeah, it's like, it's, you find your others. Well, you know? I have a question. I'm yeah. not, I, mean, I don't know why we're doing the time. I mean, I like talking anyway. Sure, sure. Like, how do you balance between being vulnerable and oversharing? Because I, I do feel like I, I read once that oversharing is a trauma response. And I overshare all the time. And people who's been on this call knows me. I've probably been in the position of that. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. So I think it was, um, I think it was even Brene Brown who said it. Who, I'm like, I'm not a mad fan of hers, but I did like this thing. It was either her or Elizabeth Gilbert. Don't share when it's still bleeding, when the wound is bleeding. Share once it's scabbed over. And you kind of know that. 
So if you're in it and you're going through it, sharing then, there's a there's a pain that comes out that isn't it isn't over. It's happening. But once it's done, it's easier to then go, this thing happened and reflect on it and share it. And also, what is it for? What are you sharing it for? I like to lead with love and talk about things that I love. There's a lot of things I hate and a lot of things that make me angry. But where am I putting my energy? And if I put it toward, I love these things and I offer alternatives for the things that I dislike, it's easier than just sharing the pain and struggle. So I love being sober. I talk about sobriety. I love being sober. I don't talk about being hungover. I talk about sobriety. Like I talk about that version. So there's always a different way. And it's not always framing it positively, but it's just all oh, like I speak about coffee nonstop. I don't talk about wine anymore. I used to be being like, oh, wine, wine, wine. Now I'm like, coffee, coffee, coffee. Same thing, just shift the direction a little. So that's, I'd say, the way to do it. And especially your personal brand is for business. You want to kind of always be linking it to something that entices someone to work with you or buy with you. So that's where we've seen you don't need to be bearing your soul on social media and feeling exposed. You're sharing what's relevant that ultimately assists someone else to make the decision of, oh, that's a trustworthy person. Does that make sense? Total sense. Yeah. Total Speak sense. to your friends about all the other stuff or your therapist or your support groups or whatever, but that stuff doesn't need to go online. It's the fun stuff. It's the creative stuff. It's your it's your visual gratitude journal that you're sharing online. It's what delights you, excites you. It's what like turns you on and makes you amazed. It's like find the people who are who gravitate toward that. That's what all goes back to the heart. Now let's just touch on tone and vibe. There's a massive shift that we're seeing online. Thank God. You should all know this with your personal brand. And the shift is from Gary V to Kabi Lamy. The way we are engaging with content has changed. It is simplifying. There is a return to simplicity and humanness and not overcomplication and not knowing everything and not being a guru and telling someone how it goes, but rather just sharing what you're into, what you think's funny, what you like, and letting people connect you on that level. We all know we work. Everyone works. If someone vibes with you, they are more likely to be like, what do you do? Or could we work together? Or what's, they're intrigued by you. You don't have to be an expert shouting from the rooftops how much you know to attract people. We're attracted to humans. We spend like 80% of our life working, unfortunately. Let's hope that changes. So likely you're going to want to work with people you like. That's the simplest way to do it. Just be a good human. So these are great resources to explain actual tone and language and styles of content that you can shift away from of the past, kind of how we were all brought up and to what content should sound like in the future. Ultimately, content is currency. What I love about focusing on your content for your personal brand is like you've seen from some of my pictures at the beginning of time, when you invest in your own content, it can transfer across the decades and across platforms. This is your digital asset. It becomes more valuable, even in time, not just for a throwback Thursday, but any time. If you've been making these things and changing these things, it's not just the content, it's this legacy of, of all the things that you've created spanning the history of your life. And you can say it was like this then, it's like this now. These are the things that are still the same. Here's what's changed. So document the process, document how you're working. Keep that all. You can move it across platforms. If Instagram crashes tomorrow, you'll put it on Lemon 8. Lemonade is a terrible platform, so maybe you'll put it on something else. But don't worry about the platform. Have fun creating the content. Now, content as currency starts moving toward Creatrix, which is my software, which I'm not going to get into today because that's auditing and that's like super advanced. But I just wanted to give you this quick snapshot because this is a blog. I've got multiple blogs, and this is a blog from my Lauren Wallet site. And you can see here my four main businesses. My candle business is not on here. These are all entirely separate brands with different social media accounts, with different blogs, but they actually all interlink and weave back together. In fact, this pack that I've made you draws from all of them. To touch on video, the rise of relatable content, why social media relevance matters more than video quality. We're in the AI world. That's what this whole thing is about. You're going to have AI doing videos for you. You can hire fake AI people to literally be speaking. But if content is made for bots, by bots, and bots are interacting, none of us are going to be online because we're all going to be frolicking outside. The best content is still going to be you. 
if we can engage and relate, a video of me talking like this still gets way more engagement than some fancy advanced CGI movie-esque kind of thing. So if you're going to use AI, make it artistic. Come up with your own directorial style, like where's Anderson? Have your unique spin on things. The tool makes it easier to make things, but take the time saved for creative expansion into how cool you could make it and really play with that time. This goes back to a quick link, which is play your ace. Your ace is your winning card. Your ace is your artistic, connected expression. Straight back to the disco heart. The smartest thing to do is follow your art in your heart. Smart art, heart, art, art. Art is the mathematical equation there. Your art, what you love. And there's a couple more resources listed here, which is making videos and then turning what you love into multiple irresistible offers online. Services you can sell, digital products, courses, PDFs. I mean, this just goes and goes and goes and goes. You've seen an example from me. You can just sell a million different things. Inside this article is also some training. If you are into video, here are four amazing assets for you. One is called the Backstage Pass Strategy for Behind the Scenes Content. Filming yourself while you're working is one of the best ways to grow an audience. Nine lesser known tips for making viral videos on TikTok. I've gone viral on TikTok multiple times. One of my videos got 3.8 million views and then again, another million views. And I'll tell you what it was. It was disgusting. I had a cyst on my back, on my bra strap. And I filmed a video being like, me, it was so disgusting. I hate being a human and having bodily function, functional things. And I'm like, me and my sister are going to get coffee. Come join us. I was just so irritated. I hadn't slept properly and I was like, come. And, and I played a song in the background called I Don't Need a Boyfriend. And it was about like, my sister causes me so much pain. Why would I date? I already have a pain on my back. Anyway, 3.8 million views. Now I don't want to be known as the cyst girl. So I don't post that kind of stuff, but random things pop off. And what it does do is it humanizes you and it draws people to you who you land up working with down the line. It's not about going viral, but it is about finding your people. So going viral is fine. It's not the be all and end all, but it can happen in the strangest ways. Here's a, a, an actual guide to, Greek, to creating behind the scenes content. This breaks down how to frame it, different angles of your camera, how to put it together, and five surprising reasons why you need to get onto TikTok. If you're not on TikTok, just please get on TikTok. TikTok is just a beautiful production studio. It's very easy to edit in there. It gives you a lot of ideas, but more than anything, it teaches you how to show up and be less perfectionist and just practice where no one can really see. So it's just a really great practice ground and you stop taking things so seriously, especially if, if you've grown up as like an older millennial, we've all been trained to be quite perfect and TikTok is just like mess central. And if you realize you really don't have to be all made up and picture perfect, so it's, it's pretty good for that. All of these resources are inside Content Creator, which is the course if you do wanna get serious about creating your own content. Ultimately, when it comes to your personal brand, you want to play, you want to evolve it, you want to create multiple versions of yourself, you want to have fun. It's not that serious. It's really not. Most people won't even see what you post. The algorithm is really bad <laughs> now. So don't stress about it. Do something you love that brings you joy, that adds to your creativity and let that be the guiding light. So here is the first Miss Malva that I created in 2010. This was for the opening of Malva as the the showcase space in the Melbourne precinct. And I wanted to be this Cleopatra, you know, whatever this vibe is, that's what I wanted. Miss Malva number one. Miss Malva number two, newly divorced, back in Durban. I was like the shorter, the tighter, the higher, the better. Through parties every single week, it was Miss Malva's parties. Miss Malva grew up in 22. I had a personal blog and then I was like, this is actually a little bit risky. You know, let me actually not go the whole, you know, lounging in my bed, overdosing on coffee. So I transitioned her into on the phone, donuts, and a working Miss Malva who had a PR agency. If you want any support with any of the things we've discussed today, Malva Media, the big mothership agency that does everything from creation to management to doing every single aspect we've touched on, you can tap that. If you want to do any of these things yourself, first of all, you have 25 free resources, but also you can get access to Create Business Academy, which is the world's first AI-infused business playground, where I teach you how to actually take these resources, do some of them, and then get, get AI to support you with the rest of them. And that's resource number 25. And finally, your quick link summary, because there's 25 different links, are listed for you right here. That brings us to the end of the presentation. I know that was super fast. 
We've got seven minutes for thoughts, feedback, questions on your personal brand, ideas sparked, or anything you'd like to share. And um, it's really meaningful for me right now because like I've made impact my whole thing. And I there's other projects that I have too that are I'm just like, oh gosh, how can I make them all work? I'm gonna get on TikTok though. I really I've I've been I've got videos, I just haven't posted them. Listening to this, I feel like I've got lots of great ideas. Thank you. This is awesome. Pleasure. Yeah, and play with all the ideas. And Terry, welcome, Boomer. Welcome, welcome. Love to yeah. see it. That is beautiful. This oh. is absolutely amazing, Lauren. I'm so excited. I'm so excited to dive so much further in. This is perfection. Take what serves you and leave the rest. Go to the resources that are most intriguing for you. There's so many. This could take a year to go through all of them. So just tap in. If you have an idea, run with that idea and test it out. Don't let the idea die. If something sparks and think, how, how do I just create this quickly and test it? Just joined yeah. Create Business Academy today. We did our first session. I was thrilled. And she signed up because I'd set up automations that I didn't even know that I had. And so I was like, oh, yeah, this is how it works. And she's like, I bought it. I'm in. I was like, oh, my gosh. Wow. Automation. Got to love it. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> I think this was very, very good, very helpful. For, for as long as I thought I was alone, it's good to see that I wasn't alone in the sense that I'm constantly online, whether for work or just podcast, and I suck at sharing. So many people have known me for years, and it's funny how little how few of them have known you know that I've been married kid situation whatever whatever and it's just like I suck at I suck at that like sharing about my personal life and I you know I don't know that that's going to change but I'll try to be better but, but yeah. if you use a prop or if you have something basic that you could start posting with even that is enough constantly like you said the multiple phones I've got that's just three of them I've got a lot more amazing <laughs> So even if you start posting with that, your caption could link to something about like your kid or your wife, or were you doing 10,000 things? You don't have, you don't have to like reveal too much about your personal life to still people get the sense of that you really got your hands full with a lot of different things. What you do so well, what I've noticed, Gabe, is you're so great at engaging. You always like everything and your engagement strategy is already on point. So you can tell you really care, but yeah, seeing more of you would be great because then people could interact with you. You're very, very helpful and enlightening. Thank you for doing this. Bye, Nicole. Thank Miss you. you. Chat to you soon. Bye. Do you have a question? Um, say you have like, so you have five businesses, basically, Lauren, freaking goddess over here. Oh my God. <laughs> why? I mean, seriously, why do we even try it? But honestly, so say you have, you got multiple projects and they're pretty different from each other right like how do you how do you do that like okay so my other project is called talking points for life and it's all about helping people navigate really tricky situations and how to communicate right and so there's like a book and there's a website and it's a whole thing there's gonna be classes well, eventually it's different from ai though like that's like pretty different. So how do you like, do I use LinkedIn? Do I separate and say, okay, LinkedIn and Instagram is for this and this is for TikTok? So there, there's two ways, but it's really within the structure of creation. So having multiple brands is like cooking dinner for one person to like five people. There's a certain amount of investment that goes with the setup of understanding what goes into it. But every person you're adding or every brand you're adding on is kind of like five minutes more to the meal. So once you know the elements that you need to create, it's not that much harder to create it once you understand that structure. And then it's up to you to decide how you are optimizing that platform. So on that page, which had like, it had platform, you know, there was brand and um, personal photo shoots and one of them said platform. One of the, the documents there is a 10 out of 10 page optimizer for how you optimize your platform. So you might decide, I'm going to put everything on Haley Wilson, but I'm going to use my highlight buttons to show my different businesses. Or mm. on my LinkedIn, I'm going to have multiple pages for the different businesses that I can tag if I need, even if I don't put content on them. Or I'm going to have different landing pages that I can have different lead magnets. Um, so if you sign up for this, sign up for this, sign up for that, and that goes into my link tree in my bio or whatever. It's Gosh. all just structural, but it's more getting your head in the game that it it really is okay to have as many as you want. And then it's having the framework for that structure and building out your multiple irresistible offers. I think that's the biggest takeaway for me out of all of this is that it's okay. And that I think I have been feeling like whatever I put out there is going to stay out there forever. No, and I'm the no one's, to no one's even going to see it in the scroll. So don't even worry about that. It was great. Thanks, Lauren. Thanks for the refresher.
<laughs> Great, Victoria. Yay. I'll call you straight after. <laughs> well, that's seven o'clock, top of the hour. I will email you the entire guidebook so you have everything you need. If you have any questions that come up, drop me an email and I'm here to help you.